relatively high point where you can look in a sort of a 360 degree uh, area to see what was what was the sort of concentrated uh, trading district with the bigger hotels and sort of more uh, more the uh, sorry the 15th Street and uh, what they called Wall Street in terms of the concentration of some of the bigger uh, slave trading complexes and some of the larger hotels that were involved in that trade, including the taverns. And then when you keep looking, then we get into the period where you, you can identify, of course, the railroad, which was involved uh, from uh, the uh, mid, the mid early um, 1800s, uh, right on up through to the present. And in the old photograph uh, from 1865, you can actually see where the railroad tracks come into the city and actually sort of end right in this area, and that was the Virginia Central Railroad. Um, if you turn around um, this way, of course, you can see where that tent is. That is uh, on the site of uh, what remains of the uh, African burial grounds. And just to make a fine point um, about the fact that on the map from 1809, which is really one of the only places where it's actually written in, um, it's written in as uh, burial ground for Negroes. And we know that that was most likely written in by the person who made the map or someone who was consulting, uh, because that was a planning map. Uh, but at the time when African-descended people named their institutions, they almost always called them African, an African church, uh, you know, an African uh, beneficiary society, and things like that. So we have chosen to use that for that reason. So, and then if we keep going this way, we want to be able to point out, and some of the initial markers are going to talk about that as well, is that when you look north of this area as well, and east of the railroad track, larger slave traders who were at it for longer, they owned various pieces of property and either operated them themselves or leased them out to others to operate them. And they tended to move around. So, you know, two-year leases, four-year leases. Um, and so you see a lot, of, um, a lot of movement in that way. But you see it, it the activity goes on as far as um, uh, 19th Street and then north as far as Clay Street. So it's quite a lot of activity uh, in this area that we're talking about as well. Okay, let's go on to the next Once you understand it, is that it was a regular part of business life in the society. We were literally what they used to call a slave society. <laughs> That's why we wanted to be sure that people really understand what we're talking about. Yes, when you look at the maps, as far as the understanding that we have from the resources by scale, <laughs> by comparative scale, we're talking four and five story buildings that took up a block. Um, this was big business, and it was regular business, and everyone was involved. And you may have heard it before, but it's a little bit of an analogy, if you like, to car dealerships, all right? If you think about car dealerships from the Mercedes-Benz glamorous, you know, place out on West Broad Street, all the way down to the second-hand, you know, will put you in a mortgage that will take you out for, <laughs> for the next 20 years. Um, you know, used car lots or individuals selling their car, buying a car, right? It, it ranges all the way from the one to the other. It's that mundane, it's that ordinary, it is that much part of daily life. So, like I said, maybe when I talk about it that way, it's hard to in that people had to figure out how to live normal lives, whatever you consider normal. Whenever we say we're tired and we want to go home because it's hard and a hard working day, or you don't want to get involved in a, in a, in a controversial issue of some kind because you know it's going to take time away from you, uh, from the energy that you have left to give to your family. People are doing the same thing all along, right? Everybody has to live those individual lives at the same time that they are a part of the larger society and the dynamics um, that, that make it what it is. So that's why. 
Alright, so we'll go to the next spot. It refers to transport by ship, rail, and road. And that's really just to give you the idea that um, the way that people were transported when they were being sold uh, out of Shaco Bottom uh, were, the, were three ways. One is by foot, and we've seen the descriptions of people being led in coffles. There are a couple of uh, uh, passages that I have read recently where they describe the, the coffle or grouping, um, which is either attached uh, by irons um, from neck to neck, or um, also by chains, of course, uh, at the angles and, and wrists. Um, but those groups would often be as large as 100 to 120 people, and so they would be moved um, by foot from here to Port South. Um, a recent thing that I've learned, because uh, I, keep, I keep reading, and I recommend everyone <laughs> to the, do the reading, um, even if you start with a historical novel, uh, it's a good starting point. Literature is an extraordinarily helpful device, so I, I highly recommend it. But then, of course, go, go do some research behind the facts that you found compelling from that historical novel. Um, but one of the things that I learned was that there was a main road that ran from Fredericksburg through Richmond and down through the south as far as Montgomery, Alabama. And so that would have been a main route for a coffled group to be walked from this area down into the deeper south. The other way, of course, was by ship. We're right here uh, where the Shaco Creek empties into the James River. And of course, that's where um, there were points of embarkation as well as debarkation, meaning getting off the boat as well as getting on the boat. Um, and so those ships were regularly moving uh, up and down the river. Um, they also obviously went north because there were ships that, uh, that carried people who were bought and sold uh, in northern ports down to Richmond and then from Richmond further down, which is the story uh, of Solomon uh, Northup's journey uh, from where he was kidnapped and then sold and transported. He spent one night here. Um, the, then, of course, the third is by rail. That's a little bit later in the trade, but um, one of the points that becomes interesting is that it was so much a part of it, and it recognized the profit uh, in the trade that it actually offered uh, dealers with, I suppose, who uh, bought a certain number that they needed to transport and offered to transport the children for free. So when you think about advertising and you think, you know, all of these, this is how regular it is. It's like looking at the circulars in your daily paper and, you know, seeing the deals for beans and seeing the deals for vegetables this week. That's normal, normalcy. That's what we're talking about. Okay, let's go on to the next spot. Focuses on two on two of the uh, larger of the uh, slave owners, slave dealers in this area. One of them was Silas uh, Omohundro. So I'm just going to go ahead and read the marker. Some of the largest trading companies based in Shaco Bottom were owned by men who controlled multiple pop properties. On East Broad Street between 17th and 18th Street, the site of the present-day Exxon gas station, Silas Omohundro operated a sales office with a yard, a pen or jail, and an auction room. He also owned or leased sites in Locust Alley near Wall or 15th Street. After he sold most of his trade holdings just before the Civil War, he operated a hotel for Confederate officers. <coughs> like Robert Mumpkin, Omohundra was married to a woman that he owned. When he died in 1864, he left her several properties, including a parcel of land with a jail on the west side of 17th Street between Grace and Broad. So it was a parcel in this block right here. William B. Goodwin, operated two jails on East Broad Street, one near 16th and the other between 17th and 18th. The third jail at 15th and East Main Streets was where kidnapped Freeman Solomon Northup was held for a night in 1841 on his forced journey to New Orleans. Northup wrote about his experience in his book, 12 Years a Slave. Um, Vera Williams, which is his uh, descendant granddaughter, was the person who was going to be here to read from the book. And unfortunately, Spring jumped up and bit her, and she's taken down by allergies, so she wasn't able to be here. But she really sends her regrets because she really um, feels that these events are extremely important uh, and was very sorry that she couldn't actually participate. Yes. So his question.
question was, do we know the origins of the name Omohundro? And I don't actually have that information, but I have this feeling that there's people in this crowd who might know, because I saw Christy. <laughs> Christy, do you know? You don't know? Do you know for early colonial studies? So it's still in, they, they are certainly still a family that is around. Um, the only thing I can tell <laughs> The only thing I can tell you is that um, I've read a couple of different things, and it's really all conjecture. My father looked at the name and said, Omo is Nigerian. Well, okay. But I don't, I don't think he was. I don't think Silas was Nigerian. Now, maybe two or three generations back, he was. Uh, but we don't know that. Um, but the, I've also heard...